down the drive, head of the School of Humanities, and uh, the professor without a microphone, so I hope you can hear me. And uh, I'm also the director of the Faith and Global Engagement uh, in Initiative, um, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you again. It's also a great pleasure to welcome our speaker for this evening, who is Ewan uh, Russell Jones. Now, Ewan Russell Jones is a very humble man, because he told me not to tell you that he is an award-winning BBC documentary maker. <laughs> so I'm not going to tell you that. And uh, I actually, for those of you who are uh, interested in Occupy Central and civil disobedience and civil rights, you might be interested that uh, Ewan produced two documentaries on Martin Luther King. Uh, and one of them actually won an award as well. Um, and as, as well as doing that, in the same way, he's also worked with, with many uh, prominent people, including Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who was instrumental in the, in the uh, anti-apartheid uh, movement. Um, now, uh, Ewan is now, now no longer an award-winning BBC documentary maker. He is now a theologian, and he, he holds the, the, the um, Eugene and uh, Jan Peterson Chair in Theology and the Arts at Regent's College in Vancouver. And tonight he's going to combine both sides of his life, as it were, and give us a talk on God, media, and technology in a talk ominously entitled The Writing on the Wall. So please welcome you and... My title for this evening is um, The Writing on the Wall, Media, Technology, and the judgment of the gods. And it's taken from the story of Belshazzar's feast in the biblical book of Daniel. Uh, this is a painting, a uh, very famous painting done by Rembrandt. Um, I'm going to talk a, a little bit more about this uh, later on, this, this story. Uh, but in the middle of this rowdy, uh, self aggrandizing party that Belshazzar throws for him and his mates, um, where they're kind of doing things to, to um, uh, to say how great they are and how splendid uh, their kingdom is. God, the God of Israel, breaks in with a devastating message for the Babylonian king. And um, this is where we get this expression, the writing on the wall, from, because the, this message appears mysteriously on the wall that, that Belshazzar can't interpret, and he has to send for, for Daniel, who comes in and, uh, and interprets the message. We'll be coming back to this uh, a bit later. The last century has seen the most extraordinary growth and multiplication in forms of communication and uh, technology of any in human history. Photography and film were invented in the 19th century, but it wasn't until well into the 20th century that cinema and then television took off as a popular form of communication and entertainment. My dad, who, who died a couple of years ago, was born in 1918. And uh, he could remember the very early days of radio and vividly described the profound impression that the sound of disembodied voices left on him. But since then, we've seen the invention of television, satellite, cable, fiber optics, computer graphics, the internet, virtual reality, mobile phones. The list goes on and on, doesn't it? In this relatively short period of time, there's been a real shift away from primarily literary forms of communication, newspapers, magazines, books, to primarily electronic uh, forms, and many of them image-based forms. We're, we're aware that uh, our technologies affect us in profound ways, but how? And how are we supposed to live with them? Indeed, can we live with them at all? My own interest in this area began, I suppose, when I first began working in radio and television back in the 1980s. Then, as now, there were many strong cri critics and critiques of, of media around, some of which, from time to time, I've been swayed by and signed up to as well. It seemed at times as if television in particular was taking over the world, forcing everyone and everything to dance to its tune. Since I first started thinking about all this, uh, the issue seemed to have become even more sharp and pressing. Satellite and, and digital technologies have led to an explosion in the availability of TV channels from all over the world. And then, of course, there's the internet. Uh, the growth in the World Wide Web in the, in the last 
10 years or so, and particularly the rise of social networking, sites like Facebook and so on, astonishing. How is one supposed to view all of this? I found these issues especially challenging as a Christian, a Christian professional, wanting to make a contribution to my own uh, field, my own culture. Um, and given the nature of these critiques, however, was, was this even an arena within which a reasonable person, within which a, a Christian should be operating? This evening I want to explore some of these media critiques partly through the lens of religion and theology. Do contemporary communication techniques, communication technologies stand judged and condemned in the courts of heaven and earth? The critique of, uh, of communication technologies goes back a very long way. I mean, it's not something that uh, you know, has, has just happened. Writing is uh, a relatively recent invention in human history. Obviously, different cultures have, have followed uh, different paths. Um, there's a major difference, isn't there, in the story of, uh, of, of writing uh, between China and, um, and, and Western countries and the, the role of, of, of the alphabet versus kind of pictogram. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I'd made a point that was particularly significant at that point. Um, but... Um, but the, the invention of the alphabet, the, the visual representation of sounds, only really happened in the second millennium before Christ, and particularly associated with the with Phoenicians. So 1500 BC, maybe some, somewhere around there, around about the fourth century uh, BC, Plato uh, turned his attention to this invention in the Phaedrus, uh, a record of a conversation between Socrates and and, and Phaedrus. And um, in particular, uh, I want to draw your attention to a story that Socrates told. Uh, of, uh, it's to do with the invention of writing. And he tells this legend of um, a conversation between Thamus and Thuth. Thuth was the Egyptian god who was the inventor of many different arts, uh, arithmetic, calculation, geometry, astronomy, drafts, and dice. But his greatest uh, discovery, his greatest invention, was that, that the use of letters, writing. Thuth was called before uh, Famous, the, the god of the, the Egyptian pantheon, the king of the Egyptian pantheon. And uh, he was called to give an account for his inventions. And he did that. But when it came to writing, Thuth claimed that um, this thing, writing, will make the Egyptians wiser and give them better memories. Will make them wiser, give them better memories. Famous, however, the, 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 the god of the pantheon, wasn't uh, impressed at all by this. And he said that Thuth wasn't the best person to assess his own invention. Famous claimed that writing will not aid memory at all. It will actually create forgetfulness in the hearers. Uh, they will not use their memories, but trust to the external written characters. So as far as he was concerned, this was a, a backward step, not a forward step. Um, it's not an aid to memory, he says. It, it's an aid to reminiscence. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of you know, an aid at, at points to, to kind of uh, uh, to reminisce, but it, it, it doesn't actually help the, the faculty of the memory. People won't have the truth, but a semblance of the truth, he said. They will be hearers of many things, but will learn nothing. They will have the show of wisdom without the reality. Socrates goes on, and after, after telling this, uh, this story and this critique of writing by uh, famous Socrates, goes on, to say to, say to his, uh, uh, his conversation partner, Phaedrus, um, I can't help feeling that writing is unfortunately like painting, he says. Uh, for the creation of, creations of the painter have the attitude of life, and yet if you ask them a question, they preserve a solemn silence. So they may look like people, they may look like real life, but when you ask them something, they can't answer you. When you interrogate them, they're silent. Writings like that, he says, it's just this, this, this 
this dead image uh, on the surface that you can't, you, you, you can't question. Phaedrus uh, uh, steps in then and says that, uh, concludes that for Socrates, the written word is properly no more than an image of the living word of knowledge, which has a soul. So the, 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 the idea here is that this is not actually something that really is going to, um, to lead to human flourishing. Rather, it's going to lead to a, a diminishment in human capacities and human abilities. Now, sorry, uh, I've, there's, uh, there's, there's Thuth there. That's Themis with his inventions around him. So forgive me for uh, having to catch up with the, uh, the PowerPoint here. Neil Postman um, was uh, a, a professor of communications in New York and uh, wrote an, a number of uh, books on, uh, he's, he died uh, in, unfortunately some years back, but uh, wrote, wrote uh, a number of uh, very well-known books, including Amusing Ourselves to Death, uh, kind of critique of television I want to talk about uh, a bit later, but a book called Techno Techno Technopoly, 1993. And he starts the book with this judge, what he calls the story of the judgment of Themis. And he says that few legends are more instructive than this. Few legends uh, are more instructive than this. Um, Themis is concerned not with what people will write, he says. He is concerned that people will write. Right? So he's not... He's not He's not just thinking about, well, uh, how do we use this technology? What uh, is going to be the, the, the content of writing, as it were? That's not his main point, says Postman. There's something deeper going on here. He recognises that our technologies shape us, so he's much more concerned with the very act of writing, not just with the content of writing, the act of writing. And um, he, he, he kind of explores this, uh, this idea um, in, in the context of what uh, uh, Socrates um, and, and, and famous uh, actually say. And then he goes on to extend this thesis, really, to contemporary media. Uh, now, Postman con concedes that there, are, there have been benefits to writing. He says that for all his wisdom, famous Socrates fails to imagine what writing's benefits might be. And as we know, they've been considerable, he says. But he doesn't spend much time, much space on saying what these benefits are. Rather, he goes on to extend this critique of famous to other technologies. As against the, the, the claims of the rowdy, enthusiastic technophiles, um, he says that there needs to be a dissenting voice. If one is to err, it is better to err on the side of Famusian scepticism. And that's what he wants to uh, adopt towards uh, contemporary uh, technologies. He says that, picking up on some of the things that, that Thamus says, technology uh, commandeers terminology. It redefines what we mean by important words like freedom and truth uh, and, all, and it does so without our really knowing that it's happened. Um, and he says, you know, famous, famous points this out. He says also that technology creates new elites who control it and that there are winners and losers in this process. So yeah, there'll be, there'll be scholars and, and, uh, and people in universities who, who'll, uh, uh, who'll uh, be able to use this, this new technology, but there'll be many people who, who miss out, who lose out as a result of it. Um, and uh, he says that, that this, this story instructs us that changes and effects of technology are not e always easy to see. They're subtle, they're far-reaching. Our understanding of what is real is different, which is another way of saying, he says, that embedded in every tool is an ideological bias. 
a predisposition to construct the world as one thing rather than another, to value one thing over another, to amplify one sense or skill or attitude more loudly than another. And this is what uh, he says Marshall McLuhan meant by the, the famous phrase, the medium is the message. So there are, all of this is going on in this, this, this thing which seems so marvellous, uh, and yet it, 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 it captures the mind, it captures the, the culture in ways that we don't see or understand. So this is a fairly negative notion of writing itself, very, very early on uh, uh, through, this, through this story. And, and, and Postman picks up on it to really put the boot into contemporary uh, technologies. Now, I just want to, to, to observe at this point, it's, it's very interesting to, to contrast this story uh, from the, uh, that is told by a Greek philosopher, you know, uh, emerging out of, uh, out of Egypt, e Egyptian myth mythology. It's very interesting to contrast that with the, the Bible and the, the, the way that the Bible uh, presents writing. Um, the God of Israel embraces the new technology of writing and he does it in um, some extraordinary ways. Whatever the reservations that the God of the Egyptians might have, Yahweh, the God of Israel, makes, makes use of it in highly significant ways. Uh, you've got, I mean this is a, a painting by Marc Chagall done in the, in the 60s. Um, and it's, it's his rendering of Moses receiving the, the tablets of the law on Mount Sinai. Um, but in the, um, in the text, it really draws attention to the fact that uh, in, in Exodus, where it talks about the, the commandments being given, God actually uh, finishes speaking to Moses. He gives him the two tablets uh, of the, the covenant law, the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. And then in the next chapter, 32, it, it says, to drive in this point home, the tablets were the work of God, the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. Now this is a human invention, right? Um, and yet this is presented here as something that God does quite naturally and quite um, unselfconsciously. Uh, there's not the, the Thamusian scepticism that we, uh, we've, been, we've been hearing about there. So the giving of the law uh, is, 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 is put in this context of, of not just these commands that are given, but this has been the, the God embracing the technology, human technology, to, to communicate. The, the, the story of the writing on the wall in Daniel 5 uh, that I, I referred to, um, that's uh, you know, the, this, this, uh, this mysterious intervention the hand appears and it doesn't, it doesn't say that this is the hand of God, but that's absolutely the, the kind of implication. Uh, so you've got that then. And then um, in, in the prophets and certainly again in the New Testament, you've got the, the promise that God will write his new law on the human heart. Jeremiah, it says, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel, with the people of Judah. This is picked up by, by, um, by uh, New Testament writers. Um, and uh, this is the covenant I will make with the, the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. So there's this, this, there's this idea that the, the writing becomes something incredibly personalised and um, maybe recognising Fedrus's point, actually, that, um, uh, uh, that this needs to be not just a, a kind of a word down in black and white, as it were, something objective out there, but this needs some, to be a living word, something internal to us. And this is built in to the very promises of God in, in the scriptures. This guy, um, so we've got then uh, the, the importance of the word in Christian faith and, and this idea of, of uh, the writing as, as, as something which, which God will do to communicate with human beings. Um, as, as we go through history, we see 
the importance of this in, in the Christian tradition. Um, obviously, it, within the Bible itself, God is spoken of. Jesus Christ is spoken of as the Word, the Word made flesh. Uh, in the, the 16th century Reformation, we've got the, um, uh, the incredible use of printing at this point. You know, so writing invented uh, uh, a couple of thousand years earlier, but at this point, um, the printing be becomes a way of, 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 of making writing something uh, capable of, of mass production. And uh, Gutenberg, as uh, uh, the person, one of the people who's responsible for this. Now, you know, I know uh, that in a, 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 this is very much in the context of, uh, of the West. Um, he invented movable type. Uh, but I, I gather that uh, the Chinese had done this uh, quite some time before then. Uh, and, and the Koreans, too. And, um, so what uh, Gutenberg, who, who Time magazine called the, the man of the millennium um, at, the, at the turn of the, the, this uh, last millennium, he, um, he, he obviously pulled the technology together and, uh, and managed to create production lines, assembly lines. Um, and the book was the first mass produced product, wasn't it, in, in, in that context. Um, and the reform, ref the, the, the Protestant Reformation in the Western context was a major beneficiary of this. Um, so uh, the, this, this thing, this, this printing press having a, a fantastic uh, uh, cultural impact and this being one of the first mass-produced products in the world. Uh, this is Luther's Bible um, of 1534. And um, he was, Gutenberg had, had been around in, in the previous century. This, this technology had been around for a little while. But Luther saw the possibility of it in terms of spreading his ideas. In fact, he, he latched on to the fact that his ideas were being spread. I don't think he, he was the first one to kind of, uh, uh, to, to, to come up with the idea. Suddenly he became aware that his ideas were all over Germany and, um, and realized what an extraordinary potential there was in this, uh, this business of, of printing. But um, Neil Postman says this of, of the Protestant Re Reformation, not even those who invent a technology can be assumed to be reliable prophets. As Thamus warned, Gutenberg, for example, was by all accounts a devout Catholic who would have been horrified to hear that this accursed heretic Luther um, had, had, had used his invention. And Luther describes printing as God's highest act of grace, whereby the business of the gospel is driven forward. So Luther sees this as absolutely, you know, unproblematic. Let's use it, the technology's there, get, get the ideas out into the world. And it's, it's, it's not just in terms of driving God's purposes forward, but there's almost a sense of, you know, the end purposes of God, the end, the eschatological vision will be, um, will be fulfilled through this use of, of printing. So Luther, the postman says, understood as Gutenberg did not, that the mass-produced book by placing the word of God on every kitchen table makes each Christian his own theologian, one might even say his own priest, or better, from Luther's point of view, his own pope. So unintended consequences of a, of a, of a, of a piece of technology. Um, the, um, we move on to um, uh, Further technological innovations, photography, uh, invented, um, it, it, well, the, the, um, the, the ability to capture the image uh, was, was in, invented in 1839. The camera had been around for a long time, known about for, for centuries. Um, but um, Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, an essayist, uh, in, uh, an American essayist, described photography as uh, a mirror with a memory. Um, form is henceforth 
divorced from matter, he says. In fact, matter as a visible object is of no great use any longer, except as the mould on which form is shaped. Give us a few negatives of a thing worth seeing, taken from different points of view, and that is all we want of it. Uh, so the, the, the notion of being able to, to capture something's essence and get rid of the kind of the carcass. We've got the fruit of creation now, he says, and need not trouble ourselves with the core. There's only one Colosseum or Pantheon, but how many millions of potential neg negatives have they shed? Representatives of billions of pictures since they were erected. Matter in large masses must always be fixed and clear. Form is cheap and transportable. We've got the fruit of creation now, need not trouble ourselves with the core. Every conceivable object of nature and art will soon scale off its surface for us. Men will hunt all curious, beautiful, grand objects as they hunt the cattle in South America for their skins and leave the carcasses as of little worth. So along comes this new technology and there's a, there are, you know, there are, there are marvelous, marvelous things about it and uh, uh, an enthusiast like uh, Wendell Holmes can enthuse about it and yet even as he's enthusing about it, he's also underlining the dangers of it and why this could be a really, really dangerous thing. People touring the world to capture images and then you're coming back with it like a trophy hunter or some great, great game hunter. Um, but you don't care about what you originally photographed. What you care about is the image. The telegraph um, invented around about the same time. And um, Samuel Morse, uh, with the inventor of Morse code, uh, he said that the, this invention of the electric tele telegraph wasn't intended to spread the price of pork. Much more high-minded than that. It, he says the, in, this, the invention was to ask a question. What has God wrought? What has God done? What has God achieved uh, in, in the creation? So that was his kind of uh, high-minded vision for his invention. But um, Henry David Thoreau, uh, 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 an American writer, um, 1854, he says, uh, our inventions are wont to be pretty toys which distract our attention from serious things. They are but improved means to an unimproved end. We're in great haste to construct a magnetic telegraph from Maine to Texas. But Maine and Texas, it may be, have nothing important to communicate. We are eager to tunnel under the Atlantic and bring the old world some weeks nearer to the new. But perchance the first news that will leak through into the broad American flapping year will be that the Princess Adelaide, a member of the British royal family, has the whooping cough. You know, so this, this in other words, you know, uh, extraordinary achievement, a telegraph, a wire going under the Atlantic, connecting these two continents. Um, and what does the American public want to, to know about? Well, they want to know about the the latest love story in the royal family. You know, they want to know about Kate and Wills and, uh, and all that kind of trivia. So the, 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 the kind of the, the crit critique of, of kind of media uh, mounting. And in the 20th century, the invention of television uh, is in, in many ways the kind of bringing together of many of these new technologies, photography, Tele uh, the telegraph, film, sound recording, combined, all of these things combined in a powerful way to, to uh, create this extraordinarily popular medium. And uh, it, television became what, uh, what, what some people refer to as the command centre of contemporary culture. The command centre of contemporary culture. And there were some really kind of hard-hitting critiques of it. And I want to just draw your attention to, uh, to three of them. Uh, firstly, that television fosters fantasy and illusion. That it creates a, a fragmented consciousness. And that it pr promotes a sense of meaninglessness and futility. I want to just say a little bit about each one of these uh, uh, these, these criticisms, but you can almost hear kind of echoes, even here, in uh, in this of the the, the critique uh, that famous um, 
presented to Thuth of the, his invention of writing. There are many, many similarities. And we have to, we have to say that they're conscious uh, um, echoes of, of, of some of these ancient um, uh, critiques too. The, in, in terms of this, um, this, this idea that television fosters fantasy and illusion, one of the, uh, the ideas that you keep hearing and, and, and keep going, uh, hearing echoes of is Plato's allegory of the cave. This is a different story that, uh, that, that Plato told. Um, and he presented this story of uh, a, a bunch of prisoners in a cave. And um, they're, they're bound um, hand and foot. And they can only look forward. They can't look behind them. They can only look forward. Behind them in the cave, uh, up the back there on the right-hand side, is a fire. And uh, the fire is, is creating light. And it's casting shadows on the wall. And um, between the fire and the wall in front of these prisoners are people who are going backwards and forwards. And they're carrying objects and animals and people and, 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 and all sorts of th things, which are casting shadows on the wall in front of the prisoners. Now, all, of these prison all that these prisoners have ever known is what's there in front of them on the wall. So all of their points of reference become the flickering image on the, the, the cave wall. And um, so their conversation together, their understanding of reality is totally dictated by what they see there. They can hear some of the conversation of the people who are carrying these things at the back, but it's garbled conversation um, and it's echoing around the cave. So even there, their, uh, their grasp on things is... Uh, is, 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 is rather, uh, rather tenuous. But all of their points of reference are these, uh, these shadows on the wall. And many of the critics of television and film use this as um, a kind of uh, a, a direct, um, almost, like a, almost like a prophecy of what, uh, what television and film offers us. Flickering images on the wall which purport to represent reality, but are only dim, um, dim uh, kind of references uh, to the truth of things. Now, it's it's kind of odd that people use this because Plato meant this in a in in in, in a kind of um, uh, a much deeper sense that the, even the things of the real world that we see around ab about us are not uh, are they themselves are just shadows. Of, uh, of the real forms uh, which are elsewhere, not in this world. But uh, the critics of television and film will use this to particularly um, to rubbish what television does and what, what, what film does. And um, to say that this is exactly what's going on, that there's this, there's this um, uh, kind of um, impoverishment of, of all of our points of reference, our language, our imagery, uh, going on in, in these media. So fantasy and illusion then, uh, f further. And, and uh, the first person I wanted to talk about is uh, this guy, Malcolm Muggeridge, um, who was uh, a very well-known British journalist who became one of the first stars of television, actually, in, in, in Britain. But despite being a household name, uh, a kind of media um, pundit and, uh, and filmmaker as well. He became one of television's wittiest and most hostile critics. Uh, the most positive image he could find to describe his own work in the medium was that of a piano player in a brothel who sometimes throws in abide with me, an amazing grace, in the hope of edifying the clients. You know, but it's a vain hope. It's, uh, it doesn't really um, uh, do much good. Muggeridge came to view television uh, as subversive of, of all truth. This is um, uh, a book that he wrote in 1977 called uh, Christ and the Media. But he wrote about television in many of his, uh, his essays and, and newspaper articles. Uh, came to view television as, as subversive of all truth a purveyor of fantasy, not of reality, celebrating all that's trivial and transitory in human existence. Just imagine, he wrote back in the 60s, and, and some of you will, will not remember any of these shows, 
um, that he's about to mention, but uh, I certainly do. Um, just imagine, at this moment, all over the world, by the muddy banks of tropical rivers, in remote deserts and tangled jungle and frozen Arctic wastes, people are watching Peyton Place. Or if that hasn't reached them yet, some old print of I Love Lucy. Isn't it terrific? Various attempts have been made to unify mankind. The Holy Roman Empire, the Comintern, the United Nations. Where they all failed, Batman has succeeded. A pope may claim to say mass for hundreds of millions of Catholics. Communist leaders are liable to speak of, of the toiling masses everywhere who look to them for guidance. But how can they compete with the man from uncle? Welcome at every hearth and home on earth, and I dare say, in due course, in the universe beyond. There's not a lot of respect here from what television can do. And this despite the fact that, you know, Muggeridge himself was a, was a Christian and made some beautiful films. He, mo he made one very beautiful film about Mother Teresa of Calcutta. In fact, it was that film that really brought her to international attention. It was, it was a film called Something Beautiful for God, a phrase that she had used uh, and which, which um, Muggeridge used as the title of his book about her. But uh, it's, it's extraordinary to think that he, t he titled his own film about Mother Teresa as, as something beautiful for God. And yet he doesn't seem to have imagined that this could be possible for that film and for other television programs. But uh, Muggeridge ridiculed the idea in this book, Christ in the Media, that, that Christ would have chosen anything like television as a, as a means of communicating his message had he been given the opportunity. Um, in, uh, in one of the chapters of the book, he imagines Jesus being presented with a fourth temptation. You know, he, he was out in the wilderness for, um, uh, for 40 days and 40 nights and, and tempted uh, by, uh, by the devil. Um, and the temptations about bread and, and casting himself off from the temple um, and, uh, and, and power, you know, bow the knee to me, all, this, all of this can be yours. These, these, these amazing temptations of, of kind of bodily needs and, and, and spectacle and miracle and, and, and power. Uh, but um, Muggeridge imagines a fourth temptation, which a television executive um, uh, offers him. And, and uh, he says, look, you know, you can have, you can, I'll give you your own TV show, global, you know, satellite, it'll, it'll be fantastic, um, be in every, every nation in the world. You'll become uh, a celebrity and um, people, think of how many people will be able to hear your message as a result. And um, according to the tale as Muggeridge tells it, uh, Jesus refuses it because he's in the business of truth and reality rather than that of fantasy and images. Muggeridge himself uh, got rid of his own television. As he put it, he had his aerials removed. Um, I'm going to skip... This, this guy, Daniel Borstin, uh, another important book, um, which, which is a critique of television. And um, this, this idea that, that television's a, a means to divorce ourselves from the real world, to create ever greater forms of unreality. Um, he says that, and he warned his fellow Americans, that they risk being the first people in history to make their illusions so vivid, so persuasive, so realistic, that they can live in them. We're the most illusioned people on earth, he says. For Boston, cinema and television are essentially seductive and untruthful media which lie about humanity's true position in the universe. And he laments their role in society. For too long already, he says, we've had the specious power to shape reality. How can we discover the world of the uncontrived? How can we discover the world of the uncontrived? These echoes of, uh, of, of, of Plato. Sorry about these noises. I don't know what they, where they've come from. <laughs> Bill McKibben, Age of Missing Information, another kind of powerful uh, critique of television. McKibben um, basically contrasted two days, one a day in television, one a day in the real world uh, in this book. 
What he, what he meant by a day in television, however, was, was quite specific. He lived in Fairfax, Virginia, which in the 1990s had 93 uh, cable channels. It's probably got a lot more than that now. But um, 93, and that was one of the, the highest number in the States. So he got all his friends and, 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 and people that he, uh, acquaintances and things, to, uh, to record every single hour of those day, of that one particular day. Uh, and then spent weeks and maybe months afterwards trying to ascertain what, how the, those 93 times 24 representations of a day um, uh, really kind of, uh, uh, what, 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 what image of life came through that. And as a, as a contrast, he, um, he said, right, I'll, I'll go off for a walk in the woods, uh, 24 hours, uh, a walk in the Adirondack Hills nearby. And uh, he used that to, to, uh, to contrast all of his hours in front of the box. McKibben, as a result, kind of blamed television for a catastrophic la loss of personal and social wisdom. TV and the culture it anchors masks and drowns out the subtle and vital information contact with the real world once provided. So there it is again, that idea that belief in a, in a real world, uncontrived and unmediated, from which the medium's illusions and fantasies forever keep us. But I want to know, is, does, does such a world exist? Surely this particular charge against television is based on an historical, romantic view of reality. What we know about the world we live in is very much connected with what our fellow human beings happen to think and believe about it. There's no such thing as an uncontrived world. Reality is a precious and a precarious construction in constant need of maintenance by those who dwell inside it. We're social beings, aren't we? We grow up being taught the myths and legends of our culture, inducted into the dreams and nightmares of our people, nurtured in their hopes and fears. We pass on what we've heard uh, to our children. We remind each other of what we've found to be true. In this world of ours, nature is never unmediated. Nothing is really unmediated. When McKibben went for a, a walk in the woods, for all his openness to the experience of the world out there, he was unavoidably, unmistakably, a 20th century North American. He didn't travel in the hope of seeing a unicorn. That wasn't part of his kind of mental landscape. He wasn't afraid that he m might meet fairies or dwarves or the little people. Depending on where we, where, where we stand in history and on the face of the globe, a landscape may be seen as an outdoor factory for growing things or as the playground of the gods. How we interact with it will depend to a great extent on the stories we've been told. And here, one society's fantasy will sometimes be, be another's reality. It's not enough to accuse television of being a purveyor of fantasy and suppose that's the end of the matter. I think that the health of a society depends on the quality and the vibrancy of its stories. So what stories are we telling each other? And what stories are we telling each other, particularly through television? We may come to the conclusion that they're not very good or very true or very lovely, but only a society that's hell-bent on self-destruction, I think, would abandon its most popular media of communication to cable stations or the internet or, you know, whatever, and just go walk about thinking that's not important. I'm just going to whip through this stuff because I've, uh, um, I've rather um, miscalculated how long this would take. But the second allegation is that, uh, accusation is that media creates a fragmented television particularly creates a fragmented consciousness and the some of the evidence that's given for that is the very grammar of television and film that it 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 it, it cuts up the world into separate shots and, uh, and and scenes and so on and that in some way or another it's uh, it's a, a kind of fragmented medium and and instruct us to view the world in a fragmented way Certainly this is Neil Postman's uh, view in his book, uh, Amusing Ourselves to Death, which is a, a, a real fierce onslaught on, on television. Um, 
he says that basically what you've got in this is uh, a, an epistemology that television uh, gives us uh, a, a way of viewing the world, a way of knowing and understanding the world. He maintains that uh, this, this epistemology has led to a kind of really serious dumbing down of, uh, of culture and um, argues that we've gone basically from the age of exposition, which he links with print and, uh, and, and, and book culture, to the age of showbiz, which is um, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the age of television, the, the, the age of, of film. And it's interesting here. Um, when I said earlier on that, that he doesn't talk about the shortcomings of writing uh, in it, when he was using the, 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 the story of Thamus and Thuth, you know, he just wants to use Thamus's critique of writing at that point because it's useful to him. Um, but he doesn't mention this in this book uh, when he's talking about the age of exposition. The age of exposition is everything, and we've fallen from that, you know? Uh, it's like we've fallen from grace. But at this point, writing is very much privileged as the finest achievement of, uh, of, of, of uh, human technology. And what we have in television and, and film as the worst. So, you know, it's sometimes, uh, it's, 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 it seems a, a rather convenient way that he, he used the judgment of Thamus. But it, this is a very powerful uh, critique of, of, of television. This idea that what we've gone from is, is, is kind of understanding uh, close reading of things um, to basically a showbiz culture and a peekaboo world. You know, the world is brought to us through the telegraph. You know, the, f the, the Princess Adelaide, the stories of the royal family, all the stuff that the telegraph offered. Uh, the, and but and worse. You know, um, better and worse stories of, of great tragedy, stories of great uh, uh, great pathos. But what, you know, what happens? Well, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the game we play with children, little babies, isn't it? It's peekaboo, you know, peekaboo. It's that, that endless surprise so, um, that television serves up for us. Um, and this transforms public discourse because what, what do we do with all of this? Well, it's, it's summed up in that phrase that newscasters use. Now this, you know, we may have been hearing about some ter terrible thing, an earthquake or a... Um, a riot or stabbing somewhere or other, and you know, but the the, the newscasters have got to deliver us to the news on to the uh, to the adverts on time. So now this, and they they tell us a story about a cat stuck up a tree or something along those lines. And so what we do with all of this information that is uh, is coming to us from all points of the the compass is to turn it into a form of entertainment. And so what. Uh, Postman's argument is that we are amusing ourselves to death. And this leads on to um, another, uh, another critique, an even deeper critique, um, that all of this basically, uh, it, this deluge of information, this deluge of images, uh, leads on to meaninglessness and, uh, and futility, a sense of this doesn't really matter at all. It, nothing, nothing matters at all. The world brought to us on a plate, but a complete inability to, uh, to, to have a sense of, of meaning and destiny. Jean Baudrillard um, particularly uh, makes these kind of points about contemporary media uh, in his book, The Illusion of the End. Right at the very heart of news, hist news history threatens to disappear. The world shrinks. The world becomes this um, a, you know, a global village. But does it really, do we really connect with it? Do, do, does anything really matter? Time, space collapses, um, but history threatens to disappear. The radical irony of our times is that things no longer really take place while nonetheless seeming to. We're condemned, he says, to an absence of destiny. And um, so the, uh, the, the notion that television is the quintessential kind of postmodern medium, um, and that it, it, it's just educated us to, uh, to see the world in, a, in this kind of um, shallow and uh, fragmented way. Um, these, are powerful, these are powerful criticisms, but I want to go back 
just uh, in, in terms of ending and go back to this story of uh, Daniel uh, that's told in, in, in the book of Daniel of Belshazzar's feast and how uh, in the middle of this, this feast where Belshazzar is telling everybody how great he is, um, he goes and gets the, the vessels that he's captured from Jerusalem. You know, the, he's, 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 he's invaded uh, Israel, he's, he's taken the people into exile uh, and he's even got their precious vessels from the temple in Jerusalem. And he, he says, right, let's, let's drink from these. Let's, uh, let's make merry with these. And in the middle of it all, um, this, 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 this uh, incredible incident of the writing on the wall. And uh, he looks at it. He can't understand it. Um, he, uh, his, his wise people can't understand it either. And he sends for Daniel. And uh, this, this guy, Daniel, who has become uh, a trusted servant, um, uh, although he's a Jew, he's, a, he's one of these exiles, he's learned the language of, uh, of, of Babylon, he, he's well versed in all of their ways, and he is able to interpret what these words mean. Um, I think it's, it, it's fascinating that uh, what we've got here is God as a writer, on the wall, God as somebody who's, who embraces this human technology and is willing to risk something in terms of saying and speaking into a, a situation. God's a writer on the wall and it's amazing writing. It's public, it's, it's urgent, it's gripping, it's kind of apocalyptic really. Um, it's mysterious, perplexing, raises as many questions as it answers perhaps more. So we've got this readiness here in this story and I think in other, uh, other stories of, of, um, of the Bible, a readiness of Yahweh, the God of Israel, to engage with people and culture as they really are. This is not a divinity who just observes uh, things with detachment and, and sits in judgment upon them. Not at all. He engages historically with the real stuff of life. He wrestles. There's a, a great, great story in the Old Testament about uh, Jacob wrestling with, with a man through the night. And this is kind of interpreted as, as you know, Jacob wrestling with God. And, and that God is willing to wrestle with Jacob. There's a, there's a historical sense here at work which is quite, uh, quite amazing, I think. And um, I, I, I think it finds its fullest expression in the Christian understanding of the incarnation, that in, in Christ, in Jesus Christ, God became a human being, the Word made flesh, who's willing to engage with the human race to the extent of becoming a human being, living a humble, obscure life, dying at the hands of his tormentors. The symbol of this God's victory, his, in his engagement with history, however, is not a kind of um, what one might expect. The symbol of that victory and of that wrestling is a cross. But even the ultimate historical reality, death, cannot defeat him. Christ is raised to new life in the resurrection, opening up the possibility within history of hope and meaning and new life. The God of the Bible, it seems to me, is willing to take risks for the sake of humanity, is willing to engage with our technologies, is, uh, and however new and untested and problematic they may be or appear to be. And I find here a fascinating model for human engagement with technology and culture. Not an aloof suspicion and disdain a kind of snobbish academic disdain oftentimes, not a fearful distancing because of the possible consequences, but a full-bodied willingness to enter into the messiness of the human condition for our good. This, for me, should give us confidence to do the same. And, and certainly uh, in my career as uh, uh, somebody who made television, I took courage and, uh, uh, and hope from this that if this is the way that the God of Scripture has engaged with history, 
maybe that's something that I can risk too. Thank you very much. We have time for some questions, um, and so uh, please, uh, please feel free to um, get up and make a point and ask a question. Yeah. Uh, what about the reason the Bible TV series? Uh, yeah. At the movie Son of God, like, what's your comment and opinion? I, I haven't seen the Son of God movie. Um, I've watched a lot of Jesus movies. Um, I haven't seen this one. Um, I hope it's good. I, 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 I saw some of the Bible series. I didn't like it very much. Um, and it, it was partly the way it was done. I didn't like the dramatizations. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I hope it does well. I think Jesus films are fascinating. Uh, there are many, many of them. Almost, you, can, you can almost write the history of film as the history of Jesus films. Um, I, I do a course on this at, at Regent College, and it's fascinating. One of the very first movies to be made was a Jesus movie. And I started teaching about this in the 1990s after Martin Scorsese's film, uh, The Last Temptation of Christ, had come out. And people were saying then, there won't be any more after this. Well, that was, that was 1989 that was made. Since then, there have been many, including Mel Gibson's Blockbuster, uh, this one that's just come out, but plenty of others too. Amazing South African film called Son of Man, uh, made uh, five, six years ago. Um, Jesus is an intriguing, intriguing character. So while I think, you know, there, I have reservations about some of the films, I think it's definitely worth the risk. And I admire the people who make films about Jesus. Yeah. Because it's fixing um, Jesus' facial features, it may be act, not acting or something. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's a very interesting debate, and it's been going on for a long time. Um, and of course, the Christian church has had a major controversies about this at various times. Uh, the Reformation that uh, I was speaking about, the 16th century, that was a, there, were, there was a lot of iconoclasm went on then. But earlier than that, there was a, there was a, a thing called the iconoclastic controversies, where um, the, the whole business of making icons of Jesus, which, um, and of other saints, um, was, 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 was felt to be something that, that shouldn't happen. Church had a, a major disagreement about it. Um, and came to the conclusion that because of the incarnation, because God risked becoming a human being and taking on flesh, and, uh, and, and therefore Jesus had a, uh, had a face, it's possible to draw, to make a face of, of Jesus. Now, icons are in a particular tradition, and it's, it's a, a, very, um, uh, a, a very clear uh, kind of sp tradition that there are spiritual disciplines connected with the painting of the icons. But absolutely the justification for drawing and making films about Jesus, people would point back to that and say, that's it, it's the incarnation. If there was a photographer around at the time, you know, you could have taken a picture, this is a real person. And because he's a real person, representation is possible. Yeah, the Caucasians, yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's a very good point. This, this film that I, I mentioned called Son of Man, which is in a, a South African context, um, it, it, it's, it's very, very South African. And now I, I, I know some people don't like that, um, but, but um, I think what it does is it, it, it says, you know, the Bible has been translated into every language that there is virtually. And there's something about that that is amazing because it says you can translate this story and it, it, it's at home in every culture, in every language in some ways. And so I think in terms of representation, absolutely, you want a black Jesus. You want a Chinese Jesus. You want a, a Latin American Jesus. Uh, why not? Thanks. I have a question. So this idea of kind of being distorted and kind of uncontrived world. Yeah. I think you start off by saying that writing the, the, the aliveness of speech is deadened by the written form, right? 
right? Like, did I get that right? That was the, that was the accusation. Okay. Yeah. We went to film, and that was um, deadening to the viewer. And yeah. detached us from, but they get back to speech, right? But I can always lie to you. You can lie to me, and that doesn't help. So, I mean, where do you get, if speech is the ultimate form of reality conveyance, yeah. how do you know what truth is in speech? I mean, you just, you just go around in a circle, or, or you assume that all speech is truth. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I wasn't agreeing with the, the judgment of Thamus on this. Uh, there is something about the dialogue, the face-to-face, -face, that, is, that is central, I think. Uh, I, and I, to that extent, I think Socrates was, was making a good point, that, um, that there, is, there is a certain kind of objectification that happens when you write something down. And, and you know, are, my, are you really behind your words on the page? You know, a lot of journalism, you wonder, is there, is there anybody really behind this who's backing it up, you know, and, and, and giving this authenticity? And I think we feel that with politi politicians a lot of the time. Is there a, a sense in which the person is really backing up their words? And I think biblically, um, theologically, that is, that is the, the meaning of the word, that, the, that, that God, the word, communication, in, in which he's fully involved, fully committed, fully authentic, and that the human being in dialogue with God, in relationship with God, is, is authentic in that relationship. So there is something about the face-to-face, -face, the I-thou encounter that I think is, you know, it is. Nevertheless, um, you've, got this, you've got writing as well. You've got writing which, you know, it may not be absolutely the best thing, but it, it, it says something. It does convey truth. It is able to get at, at, at uh, parts of, of, of experience that are true. And um, are you going to just push that aside? Clearly, um, theologically, God, according to the scriptures, didn't do that and was willing to write on the, the tablets of stone, even though he knew that the law needs to be written in the soul, written in the heart as well. You know, doesn't mean doesn't mean that the written word is rubbish. As a result, it means, however, that there needs to be something more. And so I think that the, the, the same can be true of all these technologies. You can make a critique of television, of film, of writing, as you know, it's not enough. Well, yeah, no, okay, it's not enough, but it's something, and it is able to get at stuff that is true and good. Um, I'm trying to phrase a question, but you kind of went through the history of the different mediums from like photography to the telegraph to the TV, right? And it's, it's about the content that's being presented. And TV has had a lot of criticism about the fantasy and the illusion of it. But if, if we don't look, it seems that there's a craving for, for the supernatural, for something that's not real. But if the Bible is God breathed, and there are a lot of stories in the Bible which are like, ooh, you know, with Daniel and the lion's den, and, and, and in your real life experience as a producer, have you come across or what, what hindrances do you think you've faced in trying to present the biblical story or, or the truth or God's word in, in a different, in, in a secular, in a secular world? Yeah, um, I, 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 I agree that there's a, there's a kind of thirst, whether it's for the supernatural, I don't know, there's definitely a thirst for authenticity, I think, you know, and people can smell phoniness, um, maybe, Maybe there's, you know, there is an awful lot of phoniness in the in the world of, of showbiz and, and television. But nevertheless, you see a documentary. I think you can tell if something, you know, somebody's trying to pull the wool over your eyes or or trying to do something that it that just doesn't is not true. Um, presenting life as maybe utterly victorious when we know that it's a messy and difficult business and and that we go through all sorts of toils and tribulations. Um, sometimes Christians can be guilty of presenting the world in a very, you know, ro through rose-tinted spectacles, you know, or even stained glass windows. So um, I think that actually in struggling to tell the truth, in struggling with the messiness of the world, that that is the way in which beauty and meaning and, you know, humility and uh, all sorts of things that are actually very much spiritual, supernatural things, but they can come through, through the human story. Oh, yeah. 
again. I think the voice is probably out of the to um, pick up on the um, pick up on the comments and the questions earlier on about the black Jesus and uh, a video that went viral just a few weeks ago had a Fox News correspondent stating that people just needed to get over the fact and realise that God was right and Jesus was right. And, and it was said apparently with no irony whatsoever. And my concern is that TV in particular reinforces ignorance, and largely because so much TV today is dependent upon uh, money, yeah. the, the power of advertising. And unfortunately, what that means is that intelligent programming very, very rarely gets seen by mass audiences. Um, so I just wonder whether you had any um, thoughts on that, the sense yeah. that rather than encouraging um, um, debate, rather than leading to knowledge, TV is actually doing the opposite. Yeah, well, no, I mean, there's a lot of truth in the Postman analysis, no question about it. But, I mean, I, um, I feel that, that he's, his critique is too much based upon the American model of television, which is fundamentally um, a, a commercial model. And does television have to be that way? Well, I believe not. I was taught at the BBC that uh, the difference between public service broadcasting and, and commercial broadcasting is this, that commercial broadcasters basically um, deliver audiences to advertisers. And that our job at the BBC as public service broadcasters was to deliver programmes to audiences. Right? Now that doesn't mean that there won't be distortion and that you won't get bias, you know, but fundamentally you're thinking about the audience and you're thinking about the subject matter and you're thinking about trying to tell stories in a way that is gripping and true um, and, and whole. Um, if you're thinking about delivering the audience to the advertiser, however, you're thinking in terms of the bottom line, which is getting them biggest audience. The, you know, the, the kind of, the, and, and the bottom line is money. Um, and I think that warps an awful lot of things. Does television have to be that way? No, I don't believe it does. And um, you know, and I think personally, my you know, from my own uh, my own sense as a Christian, I want to encourage people to be filmmakers, to be te television program makers, um, to work within systems, yeah, but to create the best stuff that we possibly can, the excellent stuff. And I don't think that is ruled out by any any system, even Fox News, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I could just respond to that. I mean. Um with the, probably a similar generation, but you really need to go back, what, 40 years in the UK, and uh, uh, I can remember as a child, there were two TV channels, BBC One and BBC Two. Now today, in the UK, um, BBC channels probably make up less than 1% of the total uh, networks, uh, channels that are available, and virtually all of the others are commercial. So I just wonder whether, um, as a supportive of the BBC, um, as, as, as you are, I, I share that support. I, I, I just worry, particularly, you know, given that year on year the BBC is struggling to maintain its financial support from the, from the UK government, whether the time of history is against intelligent programmes. Yeah. Well, yes, uh, I mean, I, I have to own up to being a supporter of the BBC. They paid me for many years, but I believe in the BBC as well. Um, but um, it's, it's actually it's slightly inaccurate to say that the, the government funds the BBC, but they don't. The, the arrangement in Britain, as you know, is, is, is unique, actually. If you own a TV, you have to pay a licence fee, and the money goes straight to the BBC. Now, that's renegotiated every 10 years under the BBC's charter, but that is not government support. So the, gov the, the BBC is not a government broadcaster. And I would, I would argue that um, the, the BBC um, is, you know, it's done lots of wrong things over, the, over, over recent years. There have been some terrible scandals connected with it. But it would be a terrible thing if it disappeared from, from, the, from British society. Uh, and I think we, do it, we would do it at, at our peril as well, because it knits communities together in extraordinary ways across radio, television, the internet as well. Um, 
And I, I, I think that is something that still is a good thing about British society. Um, and I would, you know, I would think that is a model that could be copied in other places. Sorry, where's the mic? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed the uh, presentation so much. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, uh, because your presentation was focusing on risk of language expression, so I'm uh, thinking how uh, you're taking why uh, God takes the risk to write uh, in, on the tablet. Because, for example, uh, the uh, the cave's analogy uh, of in Plato's Republic, it says it doesn't criticize the maker of the images, but uh, criticizing the uh, chained slaves who believe that the images on the wall is the truth. So yeah. the problem is really uh, not create makers, but people who believe the images are Reality. Yes. So I'm I'm wondering uh, if uh, the God has to take the risk to write down his message on the tablet. Uh, how do you think? What is advantage on the other hand? God. It, it's it's very interesting that uh, the God of the Bible is a God who doesn't want images of himself, and he doesn't want things to be worshipped. And I take that to mean that um, it's wrong for human beings to think that we've got a frozen, captured image of the truth. You know, even scripture is, needs to be interpreted and read and, and, and meditated upon. Uh, and it's not a book to be worshipped. And I think any, anything that... So if God, if those tables of the stone had been capable of being worshipped, I think that would have been utterly a mistake. And yet that's a, a human tendency that we do all the time. God enters into, as I see it in, in, in the scriptural tradition, God enters into, into kind of conversation with the human race, enters into this, this kind of process with the human race, precisely not to have a frozen image of himself, but to have an encounter, a relationship, which is constantly renewed. And so uh, there's, a, there's a very, very interesting dynamic here. We have, to, we have to communicate, but we can never think that that's it. That's the frozen last word to be said about anything. Right, so what's your opinion about those uh, TV evangelists like you know, Joyce Meyer and uh, Charles Stanley? Yeah. So, from your point of view, do you think they are using the media to do the right thing? I think they're trying. I think uh, they're very, very trying, actually. Um, but uh, I, I, I've never liked religious broadcasting on that model very much. Um, Neil Postman has some very interesting and amusing things to say about this. And um, he, he, in fact, he, he talks about the fact that he was, he was asked whether he, he feared th that religious broadcasting was taking over television in America. Um, and um, he said that his fear wasn't that religion would become the content of television, but that television would become the content of religion. And I think there's something to that, that, um, that the media that we use can sometimes shape us to such an extent that rather than saying something distinctively Christian, distinctively biblical and prophetic um, and human. We're actually being used or, you know, being yanked around by the kind of model. And I, I think there's, there's very much uh, evidence that some of these religious broadcasters are, um, are being used by the medium in some ways. They've, they've been taken over by their desire for the glossy image of success stories, you know, a, a, Basically, a kind of where they become the celebrity, they become the story, and um, I think that uh, a truly Christian approach to broadcasting should be a humble approach to broadcasting. How about telling other people's stories, not their own? May I ask two interrelated questions in one go? Uh, number one is, by God is the word, is it meant the spoken word or the written? 
Now, if it was the spoken word, well, either way, uh, the spoken word would have been before sound recording, and the written word would have been before writing, whatever. Uh, am I right that nine, well, to start with Jesus, as we've been talking about Jesus, uh, am I right that Jesus never committed himself to writing down his teachings? That's right. Although I don't know if he openly either instructed or agreed that his disciples should put down these writings in words, written words. Yeah. If he did, then perhaps he wouldn't mind this technology so much. But I think if I were right, uh, all the Gospels, I don't know about Thomas's, all these four Gospels that are current now, were all written sort of after, right? Yeah. And not recorded on the yeah. spot when yeah. Jesus was preaching or teaching. Am I right? Yes. So I just wonder, I'm thinking of Buddha too. I don't think he either uh, committed himself to writing down directly yeah. what he taught. You're asking an absolutely massive question, um, which, uh, which I'm not even sure I could, uh, I could begin to answer. I think that the, the fact that, that Jesus is described as the word and the role that that phrase plays in the Bible is, is fascinating um, because it, it clearly isn't the written word and it's clearly not an alphabet that is being described here. It's actually something to do with um, a, a force, a power, uh, a power that made the world so that in the beginning, you know, God said, let there be light, and there was light. So it's an echo of the way in which God creates the world through this word that is spoken, that is an event of an immense, immense power and significance. But also, I think in, in Christian theological terms, the fact that it's word suggests relationship. So that word, word needs response. Word doesn't just go out into some kind of vacuum. So that the Christian understanding of God is of a trinity, um, of a, a, a conversation that happens in the, in the heart of God before a word is even spoken as far as the creation is concerned. But there's relationship, dialogue, encounter happening in the very being of God. And that I find incredibly exciting from a, a kind of a, a theological point of view. That flows over into creation, uh, bubbles over into creativity and God wanting to enable other things, other beings to enter into this life, this, this dialogue, this encounter and Jesus as being the focus of that as far as human beings are concerned. This is the word of life. Um, so there, there are many sort of aspects of that, that that connect in with the whole Christian understanding of God. In terms of the the, the record of the, the Gospels and the, the words of the Gospels. Um, th there, much has been written about. There's a lot of scholarship, a lot of, lot, of, lot of disagreement about it as well. But I, I think it's, it, it's uh, I, I would want to say that the, what we have in the New Testament is a, a trustworthy record of the words of Jesus and that, um, that the oral tradition in which this was kept maybe for decades before things were written down was itself trustworthy. The, tra the oral traditions are not this kind of rubbish, we'll make it up kind of process, but actually the m maybe the most conservative part of the process because communities remembering a special person, remembering special events in a, in a, in a pre-literate kind of context um, would invest in those memories a great deal. Sorry. But my main point, perhaps, is not whether the Gospels, as Jesus' words, are trustworthy, but rather if Jesus himself would commit his teachings to frozen sounds or images yeah. as writing. Well, the, but this is part of this, for me, is part of the, the risk of it all. There's always a risk that something will become an idol. Yeah. 
you know, but the, the word that is promised to be written on the heart, the, 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 the life of the spirit within which, which Christ uh, promised and, 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 and spoke about, that, that therefore it's, it's worth the risk of having the written text. We need that as well. But did Jesus consciously take that risk or was it his disciples who took it? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Yes. Do we need to? Uh, one, more one more. One more question. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's perhaps the greatest mystery. Whatever we didn't, we never found out how we wrote. Amazing, that isn't it? Writing in the sand, yeah, kind of blows away. Right, yeah. It's a the medium just constantly renews and erases itself. Yeah. But I guess it also, um, uh, in comparison to that, he was also challenging the people to rethink the the medium of the stone, which is where um, you know, God's words first came to us, you know, in the yeah. Old Testament through the tablets. Yeah. But in the New Testament story, um, people were trying to use the stone to kill a person. So it seems to me that there's a humility right. there. Yeah, that, that story is fascinating. That's the only account of Jesus' writing. That story where there's a woman who's taken in adultery and they, they bring her to Jesus in order to trap him. And, um, and while, you know, they, they're kind of doing this um, this, this, this mucky business, basically, of accusing her and pulling her out as a, and showing her up as an example. He writes in the, in the sand. We don't know what he wrote and, and what, what that was all about. But the, 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 the interesting thing to me is that Jesus, Jesus, Jesus' words and actions are the same. They're not, there's not a disparity between them. So at this point, he commits himself fully. He puts his money where his mouth is. You know, and he, he confronts the crowd. And, um, and through these words that he speaks to the crowd, um, she's set free, um, and they disappear, you know. And that as an image of the, the, the authentic act of communication, the person who is fully behind their words, you know. I mean, that's, that's something to aspire to, I think. OK. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I, I should yeah. let you. Thank you. Thank you. I should let you hear a secret, actually. Uh, Ewan arrived this morning from Vancouver, so he's really uh, running yeah. on <laughs> extra time, as it were. Yeah, yeah. So thank you so much. It's absolutely yeah. fascinating. Thanks for okay. stimulating us to think. Okay. It's been great. So thank you very yeah. much. So thank you all. Yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah. yeah.